Looks like you could use some help with your window. Start at Swissco.com for all your replacement hardware. That's not working. All right, can everyone hear me? Hi, how are you this morning? Hi, John. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? It's kind of late for you, isn't it? Can you hear me okay? I'm, I'm trying to, let me check uh, why the audio is, uh, uh, it's, it's very, the somehow sound is very, uh, I would say the volume is rather low. Can you hear me well? I can hear you quite well. Um, let me okay. See yeah, hear you you're coming speakers. across. Uh, I don't think it's the speakers on my side. We'll wait for somebody else to join in and then can. Okay. Maybe it'll be a better picture. Okay. Let's just... okay. I'll speak so I, I think Stephen Mead is going to join. I heard from him. We saw the email. Yeah, I, I did see that. and uh, we did Yeah, and also I asked him, uh, he said he was going to take a contrarian position. So I sent him an email saying, can you tell me what's contrarian about <laughs> what you're going to respond to? So I think he's pretty engaged. Should be interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, from what I saw, it was something to do with San Salvador and the uh, use of Bitcoin, which goes different from uh, actually having a national cryptocurrency. And, and also, I'm not sure that any of us are particularly fixed to any particular position. Um, I, I, I did used to think, um, I did used to be quite enthusiastic about national um, cryptocurrencies. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you, how are you John? Good, thank you, good, thank you. All good. Hi, Sunit, so, nice to meet you. Fun yeah, you. Sandeep, we, we have Sandeep. Hi, Sandeep, yeah. nice to meet you. Sandeep, are you based in uh, India or a different part? No, of actually, the world? I'm in LA. So, okay. How about so it's you? Like, it's like good. Uh, yeah, I'm. I was in LA for two months, but I'm currently in uh, currently in Bombay. Oh, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. I understand from the other talk, it's raining quite hard out there today, or right now. <laughs> You know what? It's not too bad right now, but these the season is yeah, of course. You know, it's like monsoon season, right? Oh, okay. So, it felt in one of the talks I thought uh, the person was saying there's raining uh, outside. This is sort of an hour, maybe two hours yeah, ago. Look, every every minute or so it changes. So changes. we might, yeah, we might see some uh, thunderstorms, etc., uh, quite soon. It starts in 15 minutes, right? Yeah, about 10. Uh, yeah, about 10 minutes, yeah. Okay, perfect. I'm just going to pull up some slides so I have uh, some interesting other talking points. Right, that would be good. Because I notice people don't use slides a lot on um, 
most of the run, the, the, the horaceous events. But I think slides often help them even save time. Yep. In, in, in moderation, of course. <laughs> So did you have a chance to listen and sit in on some of the other talks, other sessions? You know, I spoke, uh, I spoke last year. This time I haven't had the chance. Uh, we're, we're just completing some transactions uh, from our end, so I haven't had a chance to really dial into the others. Okay. Um, okay. How, how about yourself? Uh, today I did, yeah. Just, uh, this was the evening, so just in, in a few of them. Okay, excellent. And, and did the plenary. Uh, did Sorry, uh, John. The random, um, the random introductions um, last time. You know, where you, I can't remember what they call it now, but the meet room, I think, the meeting room. And you just, five, every five minutes, you get transferred to someone else. Oh, that, that's the mixer, the social. Yeah, it's a social. This time they had it before the meeting. Yeah. In the past, I thought last year it was a few weeks after the meeting, something like that. Yeah. And I think they have it later today um, at various points. Yeah, I found it quite useful, but it, it does take up a lot of time. I always so, so it's it's cool. is interesting. You, you get to meet random people in various parts of the world. Um, yeah. And have very short conversations. So, Sandeep, you managed to put on a shirt at 4.30 a.m., huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it is one of those very strange things. Someday I'll get used to all these online meetings, but um, uh, this is, yeah, I did. <laughs> it's actually about one thirty. It's not 4.30 in the morning. But <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Sorry, sorry. So it's, it's, it could be early, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. It's one thirty. You're right. You're yeah, right. It's one thirty right. for me. That's, uh, but, uh, I don't know if any of you have been following um, Dilbert on the Zoom meetings. He's got a a phase of Zoom meeting cartoons at the moment. I, I, I saw a couple, but you know, they, they are very true, actually. As yeah. I said, uh, for the last, it's now what, 15, 16 months, spend multiple hours a day, right? Day after yeah. day. Yeah. And uh, in, in fact, for many of the office and the other colleagues, it's like in t-shirts and half the time just waking up. Yeah. So, uh, it, it, and it, it's, it's gone past, but also uh, as the offices started opening, people are back very casually dressed you know it's uh, already things that have been going casual but uh, the new normal is ultra casual at least in california that's what i'm seeing yeah most parts now the east coast is a little slower and london will probably stay wearing suits for a bit longer yeah, right. but, uh... they're, they're disappearing though over time i've seen yeah. slowly no longer 100% suits now, even in London. At least wasn't. I haven't been there in about a year now. Yeah. So, Sandeep, what I heard last was, um, I mean, I was there for a couple of months when LA fully opened up. Uh, but I hear which now... Was, which month was that? It was literally a, uh, three weeks ago I left LA. Oh, okay. So just, just in, in late June, early July then. I mean. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, early okay. July, LA, and uh, things were still fine. Uh, everything was open completely. I was living on, um, I was in the hills, uh, like West Hollywood area, and everything okay. was open. Restaurants were open, uh, but now I, I think cases have picked up. Is that right? Yeah, it, it changed yeah, because of Delta. As of last week, uh, things changed totally. Uh, uh, 
So, you know, it's again, uh, not, not LA County this time, but Orange County and Riverside, they're two adjoining counties. They were the highest in the state, in fact, in the country. And uh, it's, so the last about four days in a row, it's gone generally bad. Right, 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 right. And uh, it's just the same thing. I think what we saw happening, the rate at which grew in India or in Delhi, this was about two, three months ago. The same. Yeah. <laughs> so the good thing, at least the positive thing about Delta, uh, the Delta variant is, I guess it's, um, my understanding, less lethal, uh, more infectious. Uh, this is less- highly infectious, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so. Smart virus, very smart yeah. virus. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's uh, also the viral load, you know, and f- folks get it. It's thousand times more viral load. That means that each person they're seeing as what's seen in the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2. Yes. So, so the, the spreading risk gets to be much higher. Agree, agree, agree. Yeah. London's fully open, right? I... I it it was getting there, but you know, suddenly today I don't know. Yesterday I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's Boris Johnson can't make up his mind. Yeah, everyone thinks it's his girlfriend that's running it. So, uh, John, we basically so what one forty two give or take. So at one forty five, uh, that's when you turn on live, right? Yeah, that, that, that's when we started. I've actually started streaming, but um, it's all right. There's only oh, so this is this is live right now. Yeah. Okay. So be careful what you say, Sandeep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but partly because I I wanted to start streaming a minute or two earlier because um, okay. I, I wasn't totally confident in my network, but it seems to be behaving today. Yeah. We we had a storm here recently, and that. After that, the network was a little bit um, yeah. temperamental. I wonder if uh, if David is going to manage to get on. Yeah, probably. I mean, uh, uh, probably a few minutes late. Um, okay. But he'll probably be here. Steve, Stephen's the big mystery. He, he didn't respond at all until that email yesterday. <laughs> um, okay. And then I tried to call him, but wasn't able to reach him. But, you know, I send everyone a reminder, and I know Frank is sending everyone reminders. Must be a very very tough job to coordinate all all of this. Um, I appreciate it. He seems to manage, though. I mean, he seems to be continually on email. He's very responsive. And And he does it personally and individually, you know, what I found is. So it's very responsive, yeah. Yeah, it was a spin out from um, WEF, uh, as I remember. Okay. Okay, so we'll start in about one minute then. Um, we have a small audience. I don't know if you can see that, but um, that will probably grow with time. Maybe while we wait for everybody, should we start doing a little bit of introductions? Is that uh, is that okay, or should we wait a yeah, couple? I minutes? think that would be a, a good way to start. It's it's four forty five now, so let's start. And as you suggest, let's start with um, some introductions. Um, maybe we're with yourself, Swanee, and then we'll go from there. All right, let's <laughs> Stephen, I think okay. Stephen has joined us. Is that Stephen? Hi, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Can you hear us? You're live. Okay. Um, okay. He's mute. Uh, Stephen, you're mute. Yeah. So even, Stephen will probably have the sound on shortly. You're muted, Stephen. Yeah, I think he's mute, muted out. Yes. Yeah. So, Swaneep, you go ahead. Okay, sure. 
So look, my background uh, is effectively, I come from a predominantly finance driven background. I, you know, studied in, uh, studied in the UK, started working at, uh, at an investment bank um, for about eight years. I was at uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, a variety of roles there. Um, I then moved um, at around 2000, you know, after, after seven, eight years to um, uh, our family office, uh, which focuses predominantly on media and tech-based uh, investments. Um, and then subsequently, two years ago, started, um, uh, started a company called Mazalo, which, uh, you know, Exponite Global PLC is the entity name, which focuses on, you know, a uh, uh, entertainment-driven uh, ecosystem um, that's backed on the blockchain. Um, effectively, it's a streaming platform that incentivizes uh, the whole community um, um, to, 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 for, for good habits and good behaviors uh, on our platform. That's a little bit about myself. Sorry, it's uh, not that interesting. Oh, very interesting indeed. It's pretty and, interesting. You know, <laughs> and uh, Sandeep? Yeah, sure. So I, I sort of a mixed uh, technical background, and I've been through many verticals that brings me to blockchain and crypto. But uh, I, I'm so I'm in LA, and uh, you know my company Toroid this time focused on blockchain platforms for basically high density IoT sensors, and also the data for specific verticals, which is healthcare, biosurveillance, and manufacturing. And uh, what was interesting is how I got here. So you know, I did all the IIT, I worked at NASA for twelve years. And then did about uh, I think over ten startups, different stages or so. And about the key is that if I put it all together, so worked in sensors and you know automated system for said, for aerospace, for defense, surveillance, and you name it. And then also uh, again spent a number of years in quantum computing. Started for uh, NASA crypto and quantum cryptography. And then on the other side, it structured finance and companies and you know MBSs and asset backed securities and secondary trading but all of it basically on how do you securitize and you design derivatives. So that, that's sort of been the bridge between different worlds. And then, uh, and, and again, on the data side, it was always about how do you derivatize data, basically? How can you securitize it? How can you trade it and transact it just like you do physical assets? So uh, that, that that's kind of brings it all together. So now it's, uh, you know, again, in the IoT world, where blockchain is, is again, uh, significant, it's, it's at least moving fairly aggressively. It's been all about, uh, you know, how do you combine private public blockchains? How do you interoperate across them? But uh, the interest is really not building applications to use Bitcoin for transacting goods, but basically globalization of data, computational products, but transacting using crypto. So how do you democratize expertise really at low cost and, and, and move across borders? Uh, how do you reuse data and how do you get different people paid? So uh, it's uh, so that that's uh, again uh, where I am. And, and really the question is, you know, how do we answer what's the value of data? And then is crypto really a you know better, lower cost, less frictionless way to monetize global services? So and, and, and just to close, I think I'd like to say something which is what's the relation to the session? So I think it's it, the way uh, again why this particular topic is interesting is because it's all this next generation borderless services or anything paid through crypto stable coins and, and how they are taxed is very deeply impacted by government policies. As, uh, you know, so as we see fluctuation, the policy, it, it does affect in, in, in how you really build the services and what the uh, access are, is. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Sandeep. And Stephen, can you hear us now? If so, if you'd like to give a short introduction. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, Stephen Mead, lifelong entrepreneur, um, started 11 companies. And it's interesting, five of which were the first one in the world to have ever done something. Um, when I was 22, I went to work at Travelers Group. I read 357 books in six and a half years, trained 8,000 salespeople. But 1996, going way back, I'm that old. Um, I wanted to to have a book, I wanted somebody to build a website, process credit card orders, send me checks and mailing labels. I wanted to talk on stage and cash checks. I'm, I'm good at talking and cashing, and I suck at a lot of things in between. And in 96, it actually didn't exist. So we built one of the world's first, probably not the earliest one, but we built proprietary shopping carts 
And then we use our merchant account to process credit card orders. And Visa shut us down in August because nobody believed the internet would work. And we actually had to convince them that we were an 800 service, not an internet provider. And they switched our merchant account to become one of the world's first uh, merchant processors on the internet. Took that company public in 99. It's what went on to, to sort of become PayPal. Uh, in 2000, I actually tried to build a global currency, a uh, global electronic currency for cross-border settlement. B, B2B business settlement has always been a problem. Uh, and what we built, nobody in the world really understood. So fast forward, took two other companies public. I've had three public companies. And then what we're doing currently um, is is a closed loop payment system. We built our own electronic currency, not token, not crypto, but we've built a way to do cross-border settlement using a proprietary electronic currency inside a closed marketplace, which helps, um, again, countries do settlement across border without ever converting to cash. So a lot of fun things through my history, but always around uh, payment and B2B and, and, and big solutions. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Very interesting. And it seems like David um, isn't with us, so um, I'll just briefly introduce myself and um, and talk about one project that might be relevant to to what we're doing now, and then we'll put it back to all of you. And, um, and hopefully, by the end of the session, we'll have a a good sense of what can be done with state sponsored cryptocurrency. Um, I, I've had sort of multiple backgrounds, a lot of consulting with um, the big four. And um, I also ran a eight and a half billion dollar bank for a few years. Turned out to be a very troubled bank. So um, I got a good insight into the whole regulatory framework and the bank was sold uh, four times. And each time the banking commissioner insisted that I stayed on as the um, chairman, president and um, CEO. Um, we did finally manage to get it sold off in, in parts. And I was finally able to get out of that what was actually to a large extent a nightmare but um, we did get everyone their money back and and with interest so i was happy about that now following from that um in one of my consulting engagements i got involved with state-sponsored cryptocurrency this is about eight years ago and i was pretty enthusiastic about it um probably true to say that at that point i had more confidence in in central banks and governments um, that has eroded somewhat more recently but um, um, I did talk to several governments um, Zimbabwe um, Somalia T typically the countries that have the biggest economic problems are the ones that were most interested so I thought we could kick off this discussion with um, a quick overview um, about four or five minutes of some of the things that um, we talked about when we were proposing a state-sponsored cryptocurrency. Now technology has advanced, um, but maybe confidence in central banks has diminished a little bit. And of course, this is where Satoshi started Bitcoin, was because he, he, had, he felt the central banks were just printing too much money. And in fact, the, um, the Genesis block consists of a newspaper article about that very topic. Um, so let's see if sharing works. I haven't tried it before, but we'll find out shortly. Um, and I'll go ahead and see if I can share a deck. Um, okay. Okay, can you see that? I'll go quickly to full screen view. Full screen mode. Okay. So let's see, a little bit dated, and it, we'll just use this as a discussion kickoff point. Um, that's some Habib's um, suggestion. Um, so it, it was for central banks. This is the idea. So we're giving it up um, one of the prime benefits of Bitcoin was to was the decentralization of it and getting it away from central banks. But at the time, I was thinking we need the central banks involved um, for this to really move. That now it's moved independently of them, so it's it's not quite so critical. Um, but the benefits, having taken away decentralization, there were still substantial benefits, even if it was going to be 
a state-run, central bank-run cryptocurrency. One is that you've got much more control over economic policy and you have more economic levers, um, much more control of money supply, money velocity. You can have stimulus down to the citizen level in a much more um, effective way than we've been trying lately. Um, and you've got a sophisticated control over the balance between anonymity and transparency. And we'll talk about that probably during the session. Um, and you can also peg that currency to any kind of assets you wish, your traditional cash currency or a basket of assets, gold, whatever. And in fact, when um, Zimbabwe, we were talking about a sophisticated transition from the US dollar, which they are on, back to a Zimbabwean dollar, which they wanted to get back onto. And um, we were proposing a, um, an algorithm based on those two, depending upon the strength of their economy. Needless to say, it all went south. Um, so the other benefit is we get banking for the unbanked. You know, we've still got over half the, half the world is unbanked. And it provides very simple banking. All they need is a very cheap smartphone. Um, remove a major vector for disease. Obviously, this was written long before the pandemic. But, um, you know, every dollar you pull out of your wallet is a Petri dish, in effect. Eliminate counterfeiting. Um, major problems throughout the world. It, originally, it was a private enterprise. Now it seems to be a state-level enterprise for some countries. Not naming any names. Um, Anti-money laundering, terrorist financing, and eliminate corruption. Um, it has tremendous opportunities there. And the thinking there was that we could um, allow people to have anonymous accounts that would be set up by the banks to keep the banks useful, so to speak. Um, but that if the overview showed that there was very suspicious activity with one particular account, then a warrant could be obtained to see the identity of that account, but only if certain thresholds of suspiciousness were met. Um, retain control and political chaos. I remember I was talking with Somalia and Zimbabwe. So the thought was that um, even in the worst case of insurrection, they could um, still continue to run and maintain their currency. I mean, when Vietnam went down, and most people aren't aware of this story, but um, they, they went, they, I should say, perhaps we, went straight to the um, central bank and gathered up the gold and flew that out of the country. Um, obviously, in the case of cryptocurrency, a cryptocurrency-based currency, then um, that's not possible. Um, see, Norwich, you know, basically, countries make a lot of money out of printing money. Um, they have done since Middle Ages. And you greatly reduce the cost of printing money if it's a cryptocurrency, obviously. At the moment in the US, it costs us more to mint the pennies than to actually um, produce them. I mean, they're, they're their face value. And also, it gives you the opportunity for very sophisticated big data. You can study the crops, um, you know, what's the best crop to grow in a certain country, um, and you can follow the sale of that crop and you can go right down throughout the value chain and get very sophisticated analytics. Um, but by, by having a currency um, that you've added a few extra fields into. Um, and then, of course, you avoid the payments tax. The whole payments industry is effectively a large tax on global trade, or some might view it as such. And then finally, you get a national platform for reform and um, Maybe Swanee can talk about that in a few moments as well, because, you know, would it make sense to have a national blockchain? And I'd be interested to know Swanee's thoughts. On, would his application be better remaining on a private blockchain or would there be some value in having a common national blockchain? So those are just a few topics to get the conversation going. I'll stop sharing now um, and I'll just end it out actually with how badly it can go, which is the failed currencies. That's uh, 
one of my favorite slides to remind us that the central banks haven't always done a good job. Um, so I'm going to end show now if I can figure out how to do that. Um, there we go. Okay, so we're back to normal now. Maybe um, Sunday you can talk about um, a little bit about the the various flavors of policy on cryptocurrency that India has engaged in over time. Sure, yeah. What's interesting is, again, you know, you started off talking about the benefits of a virtual currency. And what's interesting, if you look back the last eight years or nine years, uh, it just brings us to the point where they are seriously on the table. But what I'll do is I'll take three or four minutes and just kind of summarize the trajectory uh, at least we've been on. Okay. So, and, 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 and what's interesting is just like almost all the countries, you know, with the central, and especially the central banks, India's challenge is the same, right? The fact is that these currencies aren't controlled by a central authority. So, so what that has done is that has made the crypto acceptance like a start, stop, restart, then, you know, the, the stop again, kind of a story moving from skepticism to bans to acceptance and, and, and maybe growth. But just, just uh, again, what's interesting is, uh, you know, it started off really back very early in 2012 when software developers were taking Bitcoin payments and there was a reasonable transaction volume uh, and uh, mostly from the U.S. to get paid for software. And, uh, and even we saw the first exchanges like back in 2013. But it's about just then that digital payments started coming on and, and then Reserve Bank issued these alerts saying, you know, that these are risky assets and, and, and intentionally slowed them off. And uh, but uh, but in, in the process, we did start slowly moving back 2013 from cryptos. You know, they kind of got put on the shelf and started moving towards digital payments. And then again, uh, in 2015, it was further slowed down because that was when we had all the scandals of Silk Road. And, uh, and, and there was generally, a, you know, this, this global outrage about uh, use of Bitcoin for financing, illegal laundering, terrorist fraud, everything. And uh, but the inflection point is interestingly was 2016 for India, which is in the aftermath of this demonetization that retired the higher volume uh, notes, the 500 and the thousands just to sort of went away. And, uh, you know, 86 percent of the cash kind of like was wiped out almost overnight. And in a short period had, you know, that, that's what accelerated uh, move to digital currency and exchanges started getting born. And uh, so what we have now, the Zeb, uh, you know, Zeb, Bitcoin, Secure, Unicorn, all these exchanges. So they really came all after 2016. So we started seeing that growth. And uh, but then again, as I said, you know, it's like always start growing and then stop again. So in 2018, there's another break. The Reserve Bank basically stopped the banks from accepting or dealing with cryptocurrency. And it also, you know, in addition to heavily warning uh, the consumers against investing. But if the banks are blocked, that that, that is a slowdown. Uh, and and what, what is really uh, interesting, it's about, uh, I think, in that time frame, started looking into a central bank controlled digital currency or the virtual currency. You just talked about it. So on one hand, you want to discourage it. You want to tell the banks not to take private currency, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum and the other stable coins then slowly start biasing or injecting that let's move towards a central currency. And, and then, uh, you know, so this continued for a couple of years. And then last year in 2020, that was overturned uh, just when the markets globally started taking off. So Supreme Court basically said it was an unconstitutional ban for banks not to accept cryptocurrency. And that, that did change things quite a bit. You know, suddenly we saw a huge increase in adoption. And uh, so one would think that, you know, at least we now start getting the same picture we see in the in again in U.S. China, but uh, it, it, this is all fine. Started growing till we had earlier this year in 2000. I think it was about the March time frame when there was a new bill introduced, which basically wanted to outlaw all private cryptocurrencies. It, it didn't quite go into effect, but it was a proposal on the table, caused a lot of disruption, and I, I think uh, a messaging confusion on a minimum. Uh, and so the idea was to stop everything and just go towards a central bank issued currency. And uh, again, this was, you know, a few weeks later, again, denied by the ministry. So as you see, we start something, ban it, take the ban away. Let's let's, let's you know, start growth again. So that's how it's been going. But uh, having said that, uh, what's the, the, the here's the real picture, right? Today, while Bitcoin's crossed about a trillion dollars, 
India, it is still significant. It's about estimated based on a report from chain analysis of about six to seven billion back in May. So it's not it's not a huge number, but it's not zero. You know that, that once you're in the billions, then there's enough inertia, there's, there's enough participation that is sort of not stoppable, and uh, despite some other standards. And then as recent as about a couple of months ago, the focus started moving that if you're going to have, you know, this is going to be unstoppable. So let's focus on taxation. And the big change has been uh, in terms of us in, in at a couple of places. One is asking foreign exchanges to pay same 18 percent is the, uh, you know, the GST tax for goods and services on transactions with Indian citizens this, and, and sort of make it uh, about the same as what's done for trading stocks and, and futures, you know. The, which is the commission and the expenses on the transactions. So it brings, so that, that's one revenue channel that created. And then in additional, uh, uh, in, so to bring all the foreign activity in the exchanges that operate and where, you know, with Indian consumers participating, putting an additional equalization tax. So it's moved to a couple of areas, right? One is uh, the central bank currency is becoming slowly real. Uh, the taxation uh, pieces are there. And what's going away is a proposal, I think, which was kind of like last year was to completely outlaw uh, all crypto, uh, you know, which is this uh, the last the 2020 announcement saying that, uh, you know, it would be one of the toughest policies against crypto, which is becoming criminalized possession, as the phrase goes, which just just doesn't it's just not practical in the world we live in. And, and to summarize, I think where we are is really at this stage is China driven. So again, uh, to your point, what you you know just sort of started off with, John, is uh, China has very aggressively moved to central currency for a number of reasons. You pointed a few of them, and I think what it looks and so have a few of the other co- countries. And it looks like India is basically at this stage in a real wait and see, and then make a decision. You know, the, but the, the, that's the direction we are headed in. And, and then as you move in the panel, we'll come back and can get into the details of what it could look like. Sure. I mean, I think we are definitely. Um moving in that direction and according to the um, head of the european central bank there's 80 different countries looking at um a national cryptocurrency at the moment so i think it is coming um, <clears throat> maybe um Swani, you can now talk a little bit about yep. them, um whether you think um the, the, a, a national cryptocurrency could have further application in terms of having a national blockchain for yeah. applications to run on. I'd be curious to know if you think um, your application would be better on a private blockchain or would there be some advantages of having a national blockchain? Yeah, look, I uh, completely uh, thanks, Sandeep, for the uh, chronological sequence of uh, of events. I completely echo uh, your thoughts. The way I, I just wanted to uh, go back to that for one second. Um, the way I think about, uh, you know, India from a from a private uh, cryptocurrencies perspective is there are three main aspects uh, that drive uh, the sort of um, regulatory, um, you know, inertia that, that, that we require for this to become sort of mainstream, right? So one is uh, you have got uh, SEBI, right? So SEBI's job is effectively that uh, you know, is our cryptocurrencies a security or are they not a security? So I think that's one sort of bucket that needs to be sort of uh, thought about and looked at. There are certain uh, governments across the world that have uh, created guidelines uh, to to um, make clear what is a digital asset versus a security. And they've, you know, put some s- structures in place. Singapore is one such country, right? Um, Second part is FEMA. FEMA is concerned, you know, India is a non-repatriable currency, right? Um, And so FEMA's, uh, the concern is effectively the outflow and inflow of of money in and out of the country. And I think that is a a deep and important aspect uh, for the government to consider in order to legalize, uh, so to speak, you know, cryptocurrencies or private cryptocurrencies. And then the third aspect uh, is is uh, income tax, right, uh, or, or, or tax in general. So, how, you know, how would you consider uh, this asset? You know, they'd be concerned about, hey, if, if you make a gain on this asset, 
then you know you need to pay tax on it. And so what they're concerned about is if people are making gains on these assets and not disclosing them, that kind of falls into the or that does fall into the illegal uh, aspect of things. So that's how I sort of view the um, you know the regulatory landscape in India. And, and please uh, anybody here chime in if I've missed uh, or omitted uh, anything. In terms of uh, in terms of your question on, you know, whether uh, a national cryptocurrency or, or a national digital currency, central bank digital currency, CBDC, as people are now starting to call it, uh, is warranted. Um, I think the government is uh, is is strongly uh, looking and considering this aspect. I think I think that uh, this government is super sophisticated um, and, you know, they have. Uh, a successful track record of you know implementing digital infrastructure at a at a large scale right so look at aadhaar card look at upi e-sign digilocker gstn so they they've implemented several um, uh, several initiatives at a large scale that have been successful in a country like india with 1.3 billion people uh, you know it's not an easy country to to manage right um, and so the way I think about it is that, um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of different uh, aspects uh, to be considered. I agree with Sandeep that it's a way to wait and watch sort of scenario that the government is in. Uh, you know, I think the government is clear about and I'm not speaking for the government at all, but I think that they understand that blockchain is a technology definitely has a lot of benefits for a country like India, right? Um, number, number one, the technological advancements, the intellectual capital that we have uh, in this country, um, for instance, you know, use cases such as, you know, putting the land registry on a, on a, on a you know, government blockchain, so to speak, will, uh, you know, make things a lot easier. Um, so I certainly think uh, that the government is strongly considering and thinking about, um, you know, whether to implement a national, uh, you know, central banking uh, digital currency. Um, you, you know, that that's that's I get it's kind of clear uh, with with what what they're saying, etc. I know that there's a lot of industry bodies in India that are. Uh, that are, you know, providing information. There are several unicorn exchanges, as mentioned, in India right now, um, you know, which which are which are doing uh, phenomenally well. And there's a lot of inertia there. Um, I think uh, for for our platform, you know, we started in 2019, exactly the time when the RBI actually issued that. Uh, that notice. So what we did was we quickly pivoted our model and converted it into a private uh, blockchain model. And so uh, the way our platform runs right now is on a Microsoft Quorum. You know, Quorum is a JP Morgan Microsoft block centralized blockchain, and and we sort of run our rewards um, economy on that blockchain. And so we will continue to use that until the time where things are sort of very certain. Uh, in in the uh, you know in, in in the industry, I'd love to hear Stephen's thoughts on the on this because I watched his video on um, on El Salvador, and although the countries are not very similar at all, uh, I think you know I'd love to hear his thoughts. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I think a lot of the difficulty in our industry is in terminology to begin with. Calling everything a cryptocurrency is like saying everything is money. When when we have multiple forms of payment that perform multiple functions. So to me, most cryptocurrencies aren't currencies. They're glorified penny stocks. People buy the, a, a token at 10 cents because they want to sell it at a dollar. They don't buy it because they think they can buy a cup of coffee. So having banks look at regulating cryptocurrencies like their currency, I was just on a panel in the U.S. and I said, this is this is crazy. Banks aren't allowed to custody stocks. Why are they going to custody tokens just because somebody called it a currency? It's not. 
Most of them are forms of payment. Even El Salvador, as, as was referenced, El Salvador is not really accepting Bitcoin as a currency. They're accepting it as a form of payment, which means if, if somebody sends $10,000 into the bank in the Cologne, the El Salvador bank gets the, the, the base currency. If somebody sends 10000 in Bitcoin in, El Salvador is converting Bitcoin to U.S. dollars. They're accepting as a form of payment. They aren't taking Bitcoin as a currency and holding it as a currency and using it for future payment. So we have all these different distinctions, even Bitcoin. Bitcoin is not a currency and never will be. And I know people hate when I say that. It's a potential form of payment. Just like Apple stock, if I can pay you an Apple stock or gold, but if you're a small business and you accept Bitcoin for a $3 cup of coffee and it drops 20%, you don't care. Somebody pays you $3 million and it drops 3%, you care. So having Bitcoin as a fluctuating asset used as a base currency is a complete fallacy for businesses. It it can't happen just because of the fluctuation. And then we move to central digital bank. The, the, the central digital notes to me are just another form of payment. If I pay somebody in, in de debit cards, debits are digital dollars. They just go through an old school network of cash. ACH, SWIFT, Fedwire, these old school networks move cash digitally. It's still digital but it's on a network that's slow. It's like driving on a highway that's crowded. We're using digital settlement, whether it's Ripple or a digital dollar moves on a faster network. So I believe all countries are gonna have their own stable digital coin that equals a base currency. Like what we've done, ours equals a dollar and then the prices float to the base currency. If I have money in Wells Fargo and I wanna you know, wire transfer somebody and it's $50,000 transfer, it takes 24 to 48 hours on the legacy network to move digital cash, traditional dollars. If I convert it to a Wells Fargo token, which is running on Ripple, send it across to JP Morgan to Swanee, which is running on Quorum, they're both digital dollars. It'll convert from a Wells Fargo token to a JP Morgan token and then up convert to fiat cash if I want it. So cryptocurrency is not a universal settle all. Bitcoin will never be a currency. Most banks will come up with their own digital settlement. And I think the banks and the, the countries will come up with their own digital token, which equals something stable. You need a stable unit, not a cryptocurrency that fluctuates in order to have payment. So with that, I'll turn it over to whoever wants to to agree or disagree. <laughs> okay, well, let me, so, Steve, so Steve, and then pass them out to all of you. Yeah, hang on, Swanee, go ahead. John, hold on. Yeah, one yeah. Uh, I have a question. So, do you view Bitcoin um, as an asset class? Is that right? I view Bitcoin as 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 an asset class, like gold. Less right. so than stock. I view it like a gold. It's a it's a a functional unit. A brick of gold, six hundred thousand dollars. A, Correct, a yeah. unit of Bitcoin's 50. You can buy a $50 gold coin. You can buy $50 of Bitcoin. A gold coin and a gold brick goes up and down as the same percentage. So I view it as an asset class. I view most cryptocurrencies more like a stock asset that goes up and down. And then central, you know, digitals and stable coins more like a, a, a settlement. And Sandeep, how about you? How do you view Yeah, I, I think, you know, there are a couple of points. Uh, in, in principle, I agree with Stephen, but it's not re being regulated the way Stephen, you laid it out, right? The fact is that right now it's being regulated uh, bo uh, both as a currency, as an asset class, and, uh, you know, and, and again, also uh, what I call is an arbitrage instrument. It's really all those three, uh, you know, it's kind of like a polymorphic, element right it's, it's being regulated from all those three perspectives call it a hedge or call it revenue maximization or retaining control okay but but the two things that are there i think that I, the, the key point is which where we all of us are is the fact is all this the central uh call it this digital currency is really a digital form of cash okay that, that that's that's what it is and, and the reason is that because of inclusion 
And because it's a very powerful policy lever, right? Be able to reach out to people, being able to tax, being able to, you know, affect a certain uh, class of people over duration. It's just, just, just another powerful instrument. I think that's universally recognized. And that's what's driving policy regulation. That, that's the first part. The second is, uh, you know, uh, there's also another element which is kind of playing in here. Uh, it's the, what I call the fear of missing out, right? And as you see, the, 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 what are, the three parts are, on one hand, it's, it's really in what is being dealt with the private currencies, okay? So when it comes to India, it's, it's all about uh, who can hold, how can you trade, how do you, how do you pay taxes on the transactions? So, so it's, it's really all about the private uh, exchanges between people and businesses. That's really the subject of all this, you know, debate, volatility and schizophrenia, if you will. And that's, and, uh, that's the yeah. distinction I draw. And again, if, if we got our terminology in the lane, I yeah. use stock. If I buy Apple stock, I'm going to be taxed on it if it goes up. If the government said, hey, we'll, we'll accept Apple stock as a form of payment of your taxes, if I could fractionalize my Apple stock, send it to the government, they convert it to cash. I'm taxed on the asset as stock, even though I can use it as payment. Calling the cryptocurrency a currency that the banks are going to hold. They're, uh, again, uh, Bitcoin does multiple things because it's digital. So that's why I get frustrated. The terminology is where we really need help. And Bitcoin to me is an asset that can be used as payment. If it goes up, Tax me just like you would as an asset, but you don't tax me on my currency. You tax me on the interest I earn, but you don't tax me on the currency. Yeah, I, and I, I think, uh, Stephen, you're right. But the risk is that what it looks like, it could get taxed as an asset. That means on the valuation of the asset on a particular date, right? So you end up uh, effectively what's called eating the the highs and the lows, right? So that that, that that's it, it, it is it is not clear where it would really uh, it, it would end up. But I, I think the, 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 the bigger point is at this stage, it's, it's moved so far ahead. We are in a crypto world. You know, it's just a fact of life as we live it. And it's unstoppable. I mean, in, in some form or the other, digital cash, call it central currency. So uh, not participating or banning is, is, is we passed that threshold where that was an option. I think we are really past that, that, that entire point. I, I uh, agree with that. And, and yeah. just to add briefly to the tax conversation, rather than, uh, and interesting points on the tax on whether it's taxed as an asset or tax them as a gain on the asset. Um, I think uh, another interesting point about a national crypto is it can make the tax collection process, which is um, abysmal in just about every country and inequitable, um, it can make it much fairer. You can have effectively a, a transaction tax, a sales tax, it's close to a mercantile tax almost, um, on the transaction where the funds are just a small percentage taken out with the transaction and then going straight to the government. So it benefits the government in that they don't have to wait basically effectively two and a half years before they get their tax on a transaction. And it greatly helps the consumer because not only does a lot of tax revenues get wasted in the endless collection of it, but for the consumer, we consume uh, in a phenomenal amount of time trying to figure out the arcane um, set of tax rules that we have in most countries, you know, generally put in place by thousands of lobbyists lobbying for every kind of industry. Um, so it would be possible to have uh, an instant, somewhat painless tax that is somewhat equitable, somewhat progressive, fair in that respect, um, saves the government a phenomenal amount of money collecting it, but even more importantly, saves the enormous amount of productivity that we all spend um, filling out these endless and idiotic tax forms. I, I don't disagree, but then the, the nefarious side for the governments is if everything's digital, all my dollars yeah. in the U.S., well, there, there, there's a battle. The example I use is universal health care. If the government's given me health care and obesity is a big problem, the government can preclude me from buying a, a, you know, a Diet Coke after 9 p.m. because if everything's digital, they then can control my habits of what I buy and when. You're and again, some of the aspect for Satoshi was not only around banking, it was around 
consumer controls. Yeah. Yeah. So the governments would love to have everything digital because then they can not only track for tax, they can control my habits. Uh, uh, I, I think, Steve, I strongly agree. And I, I think that, that that's the other part. Uh, you know, the community that drove the adoption that got us to this point, actually, that's a key point, right? The anonymity and the fact that you have the entire freedom and suddenly with government controlled currencies. In fact, if, uh, you know, from what you said, John, because it's digital, because it's fully trackable, fully controllable, it's fully pullable. I don't have to do anything, right? Digitally, I can pull it in and out at will. I can evaporate it. And, 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 you know, I can, I can track it uh, to, to an infinite degree. Those, 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 those are significant downsides. So, so I, I think that, you know, which means that that is all, all that implies is, is it won't be the only currency in existence across the board. It, I, you know, I, I, we'd have I private you from eight years ago when I thought, um, it would have many advantages. I still think many of those advantages are in place, but that concern. These concerns that Steve and yourself, all of you have expressed, I think are very much with us right now because yeah. uh, my confidence in government has eroded rather. And, and I think it, it, it's going to be a coexistence of both, you know, what I call private virtual currencies or, or tokens from, you know, for again, uh, call it business to business or limited or large groups, uh, at least uh, in, in closed networks transacting and then central bank currencies. We, we, we will be in a dual world and, uh, so that, that that's what it, it's most likely. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's difficult. Uh, I think it's difficult to um, to control something now at this stage at yeah. present that we're in something that is so decentralized and something that has a very powerful movement behind it. Right. So it's going to be extremely difficult for uh even if bans are in place in certain countries to 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 stop that it's so decentralized today um and i think the the key challenge of governments will start to become how do you how do you control that decentralization from a periphery as opposed to how do you centralize that decentralization yeah uh that's my personal view I think there's something of a consensus here. We've got two minutes left, so does everyone just want to take um, about half a minute with closing thoughts and um, um, takeaways for the audience? Um, I will. I'll go first. Uh, I love digital. I love crypto. I think there's a, a future for all of the functionality and things it can do. Uh, I just think as an industry, we need to, to do ourselves a service and. In, in creating terminology, so terminology allows us to better understand what things are. Calling everything a cryptocurrency just creates misnomers where then we can't, we can't define usage, taxation, regulation. Like what we worked on in Malta, we created virtual financial assets to actively create a, a terminology. And then that terminology was used across all governmental agencies. So. I'm I'm a big stickler on words because words matter and with words people can better understand action and then action leads to to Okay, thank you, Sandeep. Yeah, I, I just like to end, you know, two two points. One is I think there's now way too much inertia and it is impossible to stop and I, I don't think slowing helps. But the bigger point is this is the one area where you know the policy needs to kind of get ahead and not stay behind and wait and watch. Because the, uh, the structures are going to get defined, and uh, you could get totally left out. It, 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 you know, so so this one, waiting, watching, see what the rest of the world does, how the China plays out on the central bank. I, I, I think it's it's it is actually uh, risky. And the third is the notion of you know we love blockchain, the technology which is really powerful and all other stuff, but we don't like crypto. They they are enmeshed. You know, the mathematics, the entire transacting security, the mathematics is too coupled. That the decoupling is not possible, you know, and um, so you can't have one without the other. The, the the two are more intertwined than most people would like to believe and want. So, that's funny. Uh, look, I absolutely agree with Sandeep uh, and Stephen actually with what they've said. What I would say is, uh, and completely divergent, is that just like I wouldn't propose, and this was one of the questions on the uh, on this actual panel. Uh, just like I wouldn't propose my father or anybody to hold 
put 100% of their money into Bitcoin. I wouldn't say don't put anything into Bitcoin. So the same thing goes for, uh, you know, the central banking assets, right? Um, you know, if they would want to uh, diversify, diversify part of their uh, asset class into digital currency, I think they should up to a limit. Um, that's, that's how I would close. I so I just want to add one point, you know, it was, he's right that this was an area and I thought there's an interesting simulation data from many countries that uh, about the safe threshold for a central bank is 0.01 to 0.3%. So, you know, in terms of banks actually holding crypto asset, that's about the threshold it's same where you're immune from volatility and, you know, you could have a portfolio from a few million to a trillion dollars, but uh, it's, it's about that percentage at the central bank level. Yeah, I, I agree. Zero point zero one to zero point zero three. Zero three, right? Yeah, it's it's a, it's it's a number of that magnitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. So okay. That's what the simulation data shows where you are robust to fluctuations and other problems. Sure, sure, sure. Like the Basel requirements, etc. All of it. Yeah. Sure. So, just wanted to check. There's a question from uh, the audience. Uh, John, would you like to take anything or is it um, over? Yes, we're technically over time, but I think we can just continue. So let's see if we can address some of those questions. Um, you want to just read out that question, save time? Well, he's asking if he could ask a question. So Sriram, maybe if you want to type a question now and then maybe we'll take it. I guess I see it. He's requesting the mic. Yep. So we're giving him the mic to ask the question. Jaram, go ahead. Jaram, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Sri Ram. Sorry, it's taking a bit. Uh, very interesting conversation, really uh, insightful views. Uh, on, on CBDC, a quick question. Uh, now, clearly, the fiat currency has a very, very useful, uh, useful case because you can literally send it to the last mile so the person holding it, and essentially it can be used for a variety of ways, including extinguishing debt. That's one of the fundamental features of fiat currency. For a digital currency, what the government will have to do, will have to ensure that the infrastructure is there so that the last person to whom that dollar or that rupee, the digital rupee has to go, should be available for him to use similar to a fiat currency and for extinguishing debt, very similar to fiat currency. That would essentially mean that he needs to have a mobile device with him, him or her, at the last mile space. Would that mean, do you think countries have in place the digital infrastructure to introduce CBDC? Thanks. So, I'll, I'll go first, if you like. I think um, ultimately that can be fulfilled with very inexpensive smartphones, even just a basic text phone is sufficient to allow the unbanked to, to participate, but now everyone else chip in on that. I should now just say one other point, you know, uh, let's assume if the identity issue is solved, then technically it's not far off. You know, the, the one thing working for India is at least, I, I, I don't know what the penetration of Aadhaar or all of these mechanisms is in terms of identity, uh, because you know the, the, the two aspects to it, right? Having a phone still doesn't identify the money to the person. It only identifies where it is. So it's, it's probably easier for India than for many other countries. Uh, but it, it, it is a challenge from, uh, from, the, from the authentication. You're tying the money to you, not, not to your device. Yeah, I, I mean, it was extremely astute observation uh, or comment by Sri Ram. I think that it is going to be a challenge, particularly in a country like India, to make sure that everybody has a mobile device and, you know, make sure that everybody has that. But I think we're not arguing fiat currency's existence here. We are just, uh, I think what we're all trying to say is that a CBDC or central banking digital currency will prove to be beneficial for the overall economy in general. I think, you know, that is what, I believe that's what we're all sort of saying. It's, with, with it's difficult to... Is so long as the government uses powerful tool for good responsibly. Yeah. yeah. I, and I was going to say, again, I, to me, words matter. The, the argument that, that you were making, Shuram, was more about access. 
So whether I have access to a mobile phone precludes me from having banking. I can have mobile bank. As long as I have a mobile phone, I can open a bank account with certain restrictions. So the, the access to the technology is an on-ramp into a financial system, whether it's traditional banking, digital debit cards, gift cards, like the, the, that's an access issue, not a technology issue. And, you know, just, just like we were saying, it's the, the technology Swanita is going to allow more functionality. Digital just gives you more functionality and with functionality comes greater controls and greater flexibility. That's where I think we're heading. But but the access, people have been trying to solve the, the bottom billion access to mobile phones just for money for, for a decade or more. Okay, and also a um, uh, gentleman from Afghanistan, Sham, did, did you want to ask a question? I'll invite you onto the stage, if so. Okay, um, there's several people there who may be wanting to ask questions. Uh, any of you just step up, ask for the microphone if you do. Otherwise, we'll um, bring the session to a close. Okay, I don't see any right now. So basically, I should. I really want to thank all the panelists. I think it's been a very informed discussion. I think it's a very important topic. Um, th there's so much potential for, for good, for greater efficiency, um, but it's a very powerful tool that um, Satoshi has gifted to the world, and we have to make sure we use it responsibly. Um, Agreed. Any other yeah. quick comments, and then probably we no. Thank you. I think I this this is this is quite uh, quite interesting, and I'm glad that to be part of the panel and chance to speak with all of you. So. Likewise. My comment is I, I love digital, but I like in person better because for those of us on the, the you know, two thirty in the morning is always fun. I'd rather these all be in person, but it's it's great to be able to to participate with anything Frank does and for everybody in the audience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um yeah. very very useful, very fruitful. I'll now um stop well as I think we have everyone. Okay, I'll stop streaming now. Thank you all.